Today, we will be learning about the powerful language of Western musical tones and the science behind the musical interval. At the end of this lecture, I will talk to you about building your own motifs out of interval fragments. If you are not a musician, don't worry about memorizing these facts, but here is a brief historical overview on what the Western musical scale is, the alphabet from which we derive musical intervals. As we use it today, our musical language is somewhat derived and prescribed by bygone authorities bolstered by oral science that has been passed down to us all the way back from the time of the ancient Europeans living between 1100 and 1500 AD. Our musical language is of course a lot older than that, but as far as what scholars have been able to decipher, written music as we know it came from the efforts of many men and many women who lived in that large span of time. And from that time, we have the seven-lettered musical tones that you or your musician friends use every day. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. That scale is called the Aeolian mode. Now what's funny about these seven tones of the Aeolian mode is that we don't just use seven tones in our music. Our musical language is more robust and more diverse than those seven letters allow. So that alphabet, just like the English alphabet or any other alphabet, it evolves over time. In approximately when we call the Middle Ages, musicians realized that notes that would be in between these tones were also valuable. So they inserted special notes, semitones, so that the available notes we have at our disposal sounds more like this. This is called a chromatic scale. It is comprised of 12 separate tones. And the space between each one of those 12 tones that you just heard is what we call in English a half step. So that's the brief oversimplified history. We have seven letters, but 12 tones. You don't need to know why they exist, but you must know that they do exist, designated in this fashion. Okay, so given this, an interval step is what we get when any two tones are sounded sequentially, like this. Or like this. But music is more than just intervals, and it's more than just the individual tones. Think of it this way. Tones are like a musical alphabet, and intervals are like musical words. And we know that language is more than just the usage of words. We have to use them correctly and in the right context, and film music is all about that context. There are certain intervals that mean more to us in a storytelling mode than others. In my accompanying worksheet, which I'm going to make downloadable below, I outline what the basic intervals mean to us as consumers of Western media, and musical examples of where you can hear these intervals at play. But on the piano, I will play through a few of the basic ones now. The perfect fifth is probably the most oft-used interval leap, as it has many uses. It can sound open and vast, but it can also evoke primitive or warlike feelings. The theme of the Klingons from Star Trek The Motion Picture, composed by Jerry Goldsmith. A descending perfect fifth is also the first two notes of the main theme from Game of Thrones. The perfect fourth is also used a lot. Those of you who were alive in the 70s might remember a TV show called Dallas. It is the first two notes of Wagner's Bridal Chorus. The major third can sound very pleasant, especially when it goes up. This is a motif from Hansel and Gretel and some Mozart. but the major third can also sound kind of sad when played going down. You might identify the major sixth as one of the intervals that they use in the NBC jingle.
and some intervals produce harsh tones. For example, the tritone, which is a diminished fifth or an augmented fourth. We tend to avoid this interval while writing a melodic line as it tends to be difficult to sing and it creates a dissonance that sticks out too much. Still, some composers have dared to embrace the tritone, like Leonard Bernstein, in this example from West Side Story. Motifs, which are the building blocks to themes and melodies, are comprised of a series of intervals, and you want to try to mix them up a bit. Good motifs tend not to be comprised of just scales or all steps that are the same size. In movie writing, they tend not to be very long, four to seven notes. My favorite melodies tend to feature a variety of adjacent steps utilizing upward and downward motion. Many historical composers were on the forefront of motivic writing as early as the dawn of the 19th century, as character pieces and symphonic poems were becoming more popular. And this happened almost a hundred years before movie camera technology was invented. Most famously, the composer Richard Wagner established the value of a leitmotif, which is a short, simple phrase that denotates character. This motif here is the heroic theme from the opera Siegfried. Still, another composer, Felix Mendelssohn, cleverly articulated the braying of a donkey in his overture to A Midsummer Night's Dream. When you are writing your motifs, try to keep them as simple and as short as you possibly can. The closer the notes are to each other, and the less you jump around, and the shorter the musical idea, the better. Just think about reducing a melody to its most basic ingredients. Motivic writing can be a lot of fun. As you start thinking about your writing exercise this week, try to find beauty in the fewest number of notes. Thanks for listening.